Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn from Focus Compounding. On our live with Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great with everybody else as well. If this is the first time you're tuning in with us, thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to check out all of our content that we push out onto the internet. The best place to do that and the best way to do that is to follow me on Twitter at, at Focus Compound. If you're watching us on YouTube right now, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you are notified whenever we upload a new podcast. Uh, and if you are watching, you also can see FocusCompound.com, which is our website where you can get access to investment write-ups and blog posts going all the way back to 2005 from Jeff. If you're interested in learning about our money management services, well, you could get information on that at our website as well, www.focuscompounding.com. All of the information is down below in the description. So Jeff, how's it going? How's everything on your end? Today Good. is June 14th for the record. Mm -hmm. Yep. How's it, any, uh, any new books or anything interesting that you're reading that you think our listeners or viewers would uh, find interesting? Anything going on that's worth uh, talking about in your world right now as it relates to investing? Um, no, I don't think so for any interesting books. No. Nope. I, uh, wanted, before we jump into the topic, I wanted to talk a little bit about like your investing goal mm -hmm. and what that is and, you know, crafting a strategy around that goal. I mean, if your goal is to, you know, for example, retire and draw income from your portfolio maybe somebody would structure their portfolio differently than you would you had spoken about before you know you would think about it more so from like a capital gains perspective even if you're trying to live on that income um but you know like let's say you're trying to 10x your money in 10 years for example mm -hmm. well your goal would probably be a little bit different than if you are trying to you know 10x your money in 15 years for example right obviously everyone would rather do 10 years but i think coming up with a clear concise goal and then you know kind of uh working positions to hit that goal is something that's important because you've written about before you think a realistic target is 10x in 15 years right which would come out to around seven 16 to 17 percent you know kager over that time and of course, perhaps maybe you get a multiple flip or multiple expansion earlier and your returns are actually juiced a little bit. But I'm curious to hear like what your goals are as an investor, uh, because we're going to be looking at a bunch of different stocks today. And I just think it's good to sort of talk through how you think about these things, how you structure a portfolio around that goal. Yeah, I think um, for specific stocks, uh, expecting a 10 X over 15 years is possible. Um, I think for companies, you know, if I was talking to the management company or something, I think a question they should ask themselves is, you know, 15 to 25 years, can we increase the, the value of this company or per share by 10 times? I think that is reasonable. Some companies, you know, um, might pay more to in dividends and things like that. But I think that is reasonable for an investor across their portfolio. It's harder because, um, I think that while that is the possible upside to look for in a specific stock, you're going to make mistakes, which will drag it down. And then some things are going to come in below expectations and things like that. So I, I do think that thinking in terms of a 10 bag or 15 to 25 years in asking what's the ultimate upside in a stock is a good idea. But I think you shouldn't expect that your overall portfolio will do nearly as well as some specific stocks that you could have, because most people are going to be dragged down a lot by some of the lesser positions they have and having cash and some churn things that cost them money and, and, and things like that. Um, but it is possible. Sure. Like a Warren Buffett type position or something, you know, where he buys and holds for a long time, buys in at one point holds for the long term um, to ask that question, right? Why am I buying a stock if I'm a really long term investor, unless I think over hopefully closer to 15 years, but certainly 25 years, this stock will be a 10 bagger, right? Because, you know, the market generally and, and a lot of investments generally probably could 10 X in 25 years. And so the question is, how much faster can we do it than that? Um, and some certainly do it in 10 years. 
that's true. Although a lot of that is multiple expansion and things like that. But 15 is possible for companies to think that way and better businesses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you work that in? Like when you're thinking about the valuation of a company, for example, right? You've said that you don't really care what a company is worth. The way you think about it is what is it going to earn over the time that you own uh, the company and own the stock? And, you know, so I mean, just conceptually thinking about this, right? I mean, if a company is going to earn to get that 10 bagger over 15 years, um, mm -hmm. 16 to 17%, you know, per year, yeah. how do you almost like, what's the calculus behind that? Are you thinking, oh, it's a, you know, 15% free cash flow yield. And, mm -hmm. you know, perhaps over time, you also get that multiple flip. I mean, how do you think about that when you reverse engineer it to, hey, how can I get this 10 bagger over 15 years? Yeah, exactly that. So how high is the um, uh, sort of the bars that has to clear in terms of other things? If I know that so much of the return will come from um, something that it could have, such as growth in earnings, right? Or that I could pay out a dividend or something like that. So, you know, on the website, we have a road of um, VTS, Vites Energy. Um, that is says on it, you know, 10% dividend yield and discount to PVT, make the spin off a cheap speculation on oil. Um, so in that case, you know, at the time that it was written up, the, the dividend yield was over 10%. And um, then you would just ask how much of the return do I have to get from other things, right? And if the price of oil and gas, they have some gas too, was fairly normal on that uh, estimate for the PV10 or on the estimate for the uh, what would they be able to pay out in dividends, and you expected, say, 3% inflation, 4%, 2%, whatever it might be, um, you plug that in in terms of expecting higher oil prices over time, and you just ask, well, can they pay out 10% and have the reserves steady in terms of barrels of oil uh, equivalent? And um, if the answer is yes, then it's pretty simple. Then you have your dividend yield and then you have inflation there because it's pretty neutral in terms of the um, leverage on that company. It's pretty much debt free. So if you think they'll add debt over time, then that's a plus to your returns. Um, and if you think there'll be some inflation, that's a plus, you know, and then you adjust it downwards if some things are overpriced or something. So using the PV10, for example, uh, natural gas was overpriced, um, compared to long-term averages. So you would adjust it. That's part of the mix of what they get their returns from. And so you ask, okay, well, how much is that? Do I have to, how much do I have to adjust it down for that? Um, so that's fairly simple cause that's a 10% return from that. Other stocks might have close to 10% growth. Um, you know, I think the closest one of a stock that we've talked about in the past probably would be like OTC markets, which in terms of earnings or something might actually have, uh, expectations of close to 10%, um, in the past. Um, you know, now it's at a higher level cause there was a lot of speculation in the last few years, but if we had taken that out, we could really look at seeing maybe they could compound just their earnings at 10% a year. Um, and then it's a question of the multiple, right? If you're buying in a multiple of say 13, then you probably expect to get the full benefit of that growth that when you sell, it'll be at a multiple as high or higher than that. If the multiple is 26, I'm not so sure. Um, if it keeps growing at 10% forever, then maybe the multiple stays at 26 when you sell. But uh, if it's at 39, probably it contracts, even if it stays as a very high growth stock, you know? So you, you kind of factor in each of those things in a kind of formula that you look at it as. Most people do like a DC app or something, but I, I would keep it simpler than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the reason that I uh, was curious just to, you know, bring it up is because, so something that I thought was interesting, right? Like we, we talk a lot about, you know, 10 baggers and we actually did a podcast on, uh, hundred baggers before, right? So here's my mm -hmm. hundred bagger book. Um, uh, and I, I like to take the, uh, I don't even know what, what, what would you call it? The cover off because I like the way that the books look when you don't have the cover on it, you know, it just looks kind of like stealthy. No book jacket. Yeah. 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 And, um, you know, before jumping into the topic, which is going to be, you know, 10 baggers. And, and I thought it'd be interesting just to look at, uh, stocks that have been 10 baggers in the S&P 500 over the past 10 years and just kind of be like, hey, like, what were the the signs here? What happened to the multiples and reverse engineer it to, you know, just kind of 
uh, strengthen the pattern recognition. Um, but so here's like the essential principles of finding a hundred baggers. We've done a podcast on this. I think it's actually one of our, uh, you know, most uh, viewed uh, YouTube videos on this yeah. book. Um, okay. Number one, you have to look for them, right? Obviously that's, that's true. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, you know, goes some, a little bit more in depth. Obviously I'm just reading this. Uh, number two, growth, growth, and more growth. Uh, let's see. Uh, number three, lower multiples preferred. Obviously that's true, but we're going to look at over the past 10 years. Was that exactly true for a lot of these stocks in the mm -hmm. S&P 500? Um, let's see. Uh, if you get two and three, he says, get what I call the twin engines of a 100 bagger. So you get the growth and then you get the multiple expansion. Number yeah, four, economic yeah. moats are a necessity. Number five, smaller companies preferred. If you're going to find a 100 bagger, um, I don't know if you'd be looking to buy a 100. Or I'm sorry. I don't know if you would be looking to buy a $1 trillion company today. If you mm -hmm. want to find a 100 bagger, maybe you would. I don't know. Uh, number six, owner operators preferred. Number seven, you need time. Use the coffee can approach as a crutch. Uh, he says that uh, the journey will likely take 20 to 25 years. So you think about, mm -hmm. you know, how long that is and, and uh, holding. Uh, number eight, you need a really good filter. Number nine, luck helps. Very true. Uh, and number 10, which is arguably the hardest of them all, you should be a reluctant seller. And when I say that's the hardest of the all is we talk about Amazon right as an example like what if you put ten thousand dollars in amazon at its ipo i don't remember the exact stats but through the bubble i think it went up to like something crazy like a million dollars and then back down to like seventy thousand or sixty thousand then back up to sixty six hundred grand i mean so imagine the mental gymnastics of holding that we talk about it after the fact but imagine investing ten thousand, seeing it go to whatever a million bucks then seeing it go back down you'd be thinking oh i'm such an mm -hmm. idiot i have it i had it made i i finally you know i could have uh you know re perhaps retired paid off my debt i'm an idiot i really miss this one uh so you know holding is 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 very hard um so that's 100 baggers but i wanted to just pull over the past 10 years so this is going back um uh, to 2013 and I wanted to, you know, see which stocks in the S&P 500 have been 10 baggers or better. And there's a list of like 30 stocks here that we can go through. No surprise, uh, NVIDIA is, is number one. Um, total return right here. This is actually a percentage. So mm -hmm. uh, Kager total return, that's 62% annualized over time. Total return of, you know, just in general was... 12,219%. So for people watching, that's what it is. I was surprised, Jeff, by the amount of semiconductor stocks on this list. Yeah. And there are a large list of contenders that didn't meet the threshold of a 10-bagger in total return over the past 10 years. Um, but I was shocked. There's a lot of semiconductors on this list, which if you look at how they break it down in the S&P 500, they fall in the basket of information technology, and that represents 28% okay. of the S&P 500. But so we could, uh, you know, NVIDIA, we, we talked a little bit about that in uh, a, a recent podcast, but we can just go down the list and, you know, see uh, some takeaways. And I have some takeaways written down when I was compiling all this data, and we could just uh, chat about it. So AMD is uh or has been a, a 10 bagger going back to 2013 the uh multiple now this is a cyclical company but i mean the state of multiple i didn't normalize any of this i just took the raw data was negative 34 times earnings in 2013 and now we're trading at 507 times today on a TTM basis. You know, we've talked a lot about like Nvidia and all these other stocks, but even like AMD, for example, is up like 100% year to date. Uh, yeah. The growth has just been absolutely crazy. But we can look at, you know, the key ratios and you'll see right here in 2013, uh, we're talking a $2.8 billion market cap. And, 
you know, now this is, I mean, what's it currently at right now? Now we're at a $200 billion um, mm -hmm. market cap. So obviously, I mean, just exponential growth. You've gotten multiple expansion. I mean, significant expansion. You look at gross margins, it's improved. EBITDA margins, it's improved. Growth, of course, has improved. So basically everywhere across the map with this company, um, has improved. You look at return on equity of 10.5%, very lumpy, but then a 10 year Kager on uh, assets of 32%, you know, that's coming from somewhere. So, yeah, I mean, any general thoughts on AMD? I mean, hard to kind of tell. I mean, this is a very cyclical uh, company, but the growth has just been exponential. Now, what's funny though is I talked about the market capitalization growth. I mean, in 2013, they did 5 billion in um, revenue, and now in 2022, uh, they only did 23 billion, but that translated right. into just an insane share growth over that time frame. And we don't know how much of that is um, due to cyclicality as an issue, right? So 2013 to 2019, it less than doubles um, in terms of size. Uh, in fact, it shrinks quite a bit to get down to 2015. It's very, very cyclical. Um, and then it, it booms into the 20. Uh, 2020, 2020 through 2022. The the big difference that you'll notice in terms of how cyclical it is and why I would avoid stocks like this for people listening generally is uh, gross profit. So gross profit is usually more indicative than, than sales to understand the health of a company. And as you can see, they had a very long time in which um, they had trouble producing gross profits that were higher than they had been in the past. And then really just exploded since COVID in, um, other than that, we don't really see a much of an increase in gross profit. So from 2013 to 2019, even if we went back years before that, you really haven't had any growth in gross profit at this company. That's meaningful even when you've been using more assets. But then 2020 through 2022, you have very high returns. Um, and I would guess that that generally means that this is cyclical. But we don't know. It's when we talk about Micron. When we, I mean, the long-term returns are not very... Um, positive by most economic indicators. As you can see, they have long periods where they have negative returns on invested capital. And then if you measure from a period that's a cyclical high point, then their overall results are good. If you measure from a cyclical low point, they're not good. So like if we did the same calculation but stopped in 2019 or something, it looks like their long-term performance is bad. But if you take it out to a part where they peaked again, it looks good. Micron is a similar situation where you can always do that with that company. Yeah, it's interesting. You think about like the different game that Buffett plays from investing in these type of securities. So the Buffett screener, right? 15 times EPS next year, 90% sure to have uh, earnings per share be higher in mm -hmm. five years and a 50-50 chance of compounding at 7% a year. I mean, he obviously would never even look at uh, a company. like I mean, maybe he'd look at it, but it's just not the type of business that uh, he would invest in. Um, and you, know, you think about like the small world that he's focusing on, you know, out of all these companies, the 500 companies in the SP 500, I'd said only 30 have been 10 baggers in total return over the past 10 years. I mean, that's 6% of the S and P 500. So, uh, and a lot of those are semiconductors, which he would probably avoid. Um, so you just kind of think about, uh, how challenging the game is that he's, uh, focusing on and playing, uh, given with, you know, his framework. So uh, we can go on to the next one. This one was just completely shocking to me. Uh, I should point out that the average S&P 500 uh, multiple on a PE basis was 17 times in 2013. Ticker AVGO Broadcom Inc. And I mean, the, the I don't know if and again, I'm not including any companies that, you know, have been acquired or merged. I purely took the S&P 500 right. today and then just, you know, took the highest 10-year uh, re total return over the past 10 years, the ones that have 10-bagged. Uh, uh, another semiconductor, but this one I believe is in broadband, maybe, maybe not. No, yeah, semiconductor and semiconductor equipment is the industry. Um, <laughs> another company that's just, you know... Uh, the revenue is, you know, more than 10 bag going from 2.5 billion to 33 billion uh, today. The market capitalization is 351 billion. We can look at what it was in uh, 2013, 
3 billion. Here's an example where at least, I don't know, again, I didn't adjust for anything cyclical, but the PE was 20 times in 2013. And today it's a little bit less than that. It is, I'm oh, just kidding, it's 25 times uh, where we are today. Earnings have gone up from you know 552 million to on a TTM basis, 13.6 billion. They've also mm-hmm. diluted total shares outstanding has gone from 252 million to 424 million. I don't know. This is just one of those situations where I'm like, hmm, we probably wouldn't have invested in this. Like just looking from um, mm-hmm. a bird's eye view and the returns have just clearly been phenomenal and they've diluted along the way and return invested capital yeah. is wobbly and all over the place and gross margins are all over the place. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, so um, gross profit has increased by a huge amount, and that's where you got much of the return. Um, About half of the return, I think, has come from an increase in the multiple that you paid versus gross profit. But if you just look at it as gross profit, um, then about half is just from the increase in gross profit. Um, Revenue is similar, but a little bit less. So it's improved uh, that number a little bit better. Um, it has high free cash flow um, conversion generally. Um, there are some issues. Um, similarly, you have a very large expansion in gross margin, which is probably due to pricing. Um, we don't know that, but it just in general, if you look at gross margin and revenue, and some things like that that have to do with growth that generally is what that reflects. Um, and that is particularly noticeable from about 2019 to today. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's a surprisingly strong pricing environment compared to what you're used to. For instance, you can look before then at 2013 to 2019 or so. And um, I would just say that margins by most measures in 2021 and 2022 look different than they do in all other years. Um, so on a price to sales basis, it's quite expensive 10 times. Um, but it has had high free cash flow generation at least. Um, so that's not crazy. Um, although, like I said, I would know, I would, I think you shouldn't buy a stock at more than 10 times sales. I can't think of a case Mm -hmm. where that'd be a good idea, but I wanted to talk about like the opposite of NVIDIA. So remember how, Mm -hmm. We spoke about NVIDIA likely needed to uh, grow its earnings at some astronomical number just to basically make up from multiple contraction uh, that can happen at the company over the next, you know, 10 to 15 years. If you look at Mm. Meta, and there's a few different companies in this list uh, where it was a very similar situation. However, they grew into their valuation and then some, which is very interesting. So I just, I wanted to demonstrate this on the podcast to sort of just give the other side of NVIDIA. So currently trading at 32 times earnings. Uh, we're talking a $700 billion market cap. Uh, but if you go back to 2013, they were trading at 92 times earnings. Uh, mm-hmm. 2014, 73 times earnings, right? And so you've seen that the uh, multiple of earnings has contracted over time. I'll yeah. just read it for the listeners. From 2013, 92 times, uh, 73 times, 80 times, 32, 32, 17, 32, 27, uh, 23, uh, 14. And then, like I said, we're, we're up a little bit now. But the multiple is basically down like, what's that? I mean, you know, uh, 60, 70, 80%, whatever that is over that time. But the market capitalization has gone from $139 billion in 2013 to whatever I just said it was today, 700 billion. And that's after Meta has has sold off. But at its peak, you know, we're talking, I think it, you know, it was around a trillion dollars, $921 billion market capitalization. Mm-hmm. So what does that look like? A company that has had its multiple go down by a significant amount, but its market capitalization go up over that time frame, right? Well, yeah. you need growth. <laughs> if you're having multiple contraction in an extreme way, you need growth in an extreme way. Uh, so you look at gross margins, um, you know, they've kind of gotten better to, they're kind of gone back down, I guess, over the past five years. But year over year growth in revenue, EBITDA, operating income, 
net income, everything has just exploded higher. Uh, mm -hmm. But you get, you know, gross profit going from six billion to ninety one billion over the past ten years. Operating profit going from two point eight billion to uh, twenty nine billion. Net income going from one point five billion to um, a TTM of twenty one billion. So you've had extreme growth in the company. So I just thought that was an interesting mm -hmm. example of a company that has had its multiple drop incredibly, but they've been able to grow into the valuation and then some, you know, multiples uh, and, and, you know, still, I guess, do okay. And, and has put up a, you know, this stock has been, a, you know, a 10 bagger, greater than a 10 bagger over the past 10 yeah. years. Meta. So a couple of things about that. One is the timing. So if you look, this stock, if you had held it till about a year ago, um, not quite. I mean, it would be uh, October of last year. If you held it for 10 years till October of last year, you'd be in about the same place as if you held the S&P for 10 years. It was about the same. Um, so the contraction of the multiple got so extreme in that period that you see there that buying it around the time of the IPO till then, at that very moment, you would be about even. Um so, but you would have been way ahead a year before and you've been way ahead a year after. It's just if you sold at that moment where the multiple got really low, right? The, the P got down to like 10 or something at that moment. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind is how important multiple contraction is even on stocks that seem like they performed really well. If they contract a lot, you have a problem. You know, Berkshire Hathaway at this point would have to go down 99% or something for for Buffett to bring it back even with the S&P since he started. But for a stock, for most stocks over 10 years or something, it doesn't take much more than a decline of 70% or something. And that can be purely multiple. There's no stock we've talked about today that can't drop 70% in terms of the multiple tomorrow with the, the earnings the same or higher. Um, the other things are, one, like we talked about, with an anchor of the high multiple, it did okay. Because if it grew, so for instance, it grew revenue of 35%, 40%, something like that over 10 years. Um, where we talked about with NVIDIA, I said it was only about 15% a year for 15 years or something was the drag that at the time that I said from price, um, which isn't impossible. It, you know, you can overcome that. Um, NVIDIA is actually not a very large company. It's a very large stock, but you know, so it is possible when you kind of do the math on, okay, how big could it get? How big could that part of our economy get and everything? It's possible you could grow 15% a year faster, but you have to do that just to get even. And so obviously with, um, meta, it easily grew, you know, 25, 30% faster than other stocks. And so that makes up for it, even though you have the price going down and although the price is very high, it wasn't as high as like nvidia quite um on an earnings basis pretty high but on some other basis it was not quite as high um so i think all of those are important factors and then the other thing that's very important to keep in mind because this is the part that everyone gets wrong is uh in a year in which they had revenue do really badly the multiple expanded so it the company, it said things and stuff and, you know, the public understood. And so it contracted by a huge amount, over contracted maybe, ahead of a bad performance in revenue. And then actually when that performance came in, it expanded, you know. Um, so what does that tell you? Does that tell you that the market is always 12 to 18 months ahead into the future? Uh, maybe. Uh, you know, I, I doubt it. But it's possible. I think that it's an issue of sentiment that may be largely unrelated to the stock. Uh, this is a business performance. Uh, that could be true with NVIDIA too. I mean, it's wrong as much as it's right on these things. Like the excitement with the NVIDIA and the AI and everything. It could be right for a time, but it could be very wrong. Um, if you look at some nifty 50 things, they're very right about the durability of those companies. If you look at some internet 2000 things, they're very wrong about the fact that they would be growth stocks afterwards that many of them are not growth stocks at all after that. So it's hard to know. Um, yeah, it's just very hard to know. Uh, obviously there would have been many times where people would have thought meta would have slowed down before and it didn't. Um, so there are also other factors going on. Earnings could contract more, you know, free cash flow, things like that could contract more than, than the issues with revenue at that time and did. 
Um, I think they had a 50% drop in operating profit because they were spending a lot on, um, you know, VR or augmented reality or whatever. Um, at the same time that they had some decline in revenue. So the actual earnings performance was even worse. Um, but yeah, it's often hard to tell. I don't know sometimes why the multiples go the way they do with companies. And, uh, sometimes it's one way and then, you know, a lot of hundred baggers and stuff we've talked about are that way. Why was the multiple quite as low as it was on tractor supply? Why did it get as high as it did? I don't know. People discover the company, you know, um, we lived through it. So there was a real change in attitude about meta. Some of it was concerns about political things. Some of it was it getting too big. Um, some of it was also just driven by perceptions of popularity and stuff that may be true, but also may not necessarily have a lot to do with how much money they make, right? So, I mean, honestly, I think a huge part of that's TikTok, but I don't know. That would be my guess, though, is looking at it and the stock chart and stuff is just if we looked at headlines of how often is TikTok discussed and what does Meta's multiple look like and everything, I think at peak sort of TikTok taking over the world um, is probably a bad time for Meta. And then as more negative stuff happens with TikTok, there's more positive action in the stock. Um, but there could be other reasons for it, but that's my guess that that kind of takes up a lot of the oxygen, just like I think NVIDIA, whether it has a lot to do with the stock or not, is a lot of AI, and I do attribute it largely to chat GPT appearing in lots of headlines for people who otherwise won't even be focusing on it. And so just what level of discussion are you doing of that kind of thing, I think can have a huge impact. Yeah, I mean, uh, the 10-year total return Kager in Meta as of today is 28% annualized. The total return over the time period not Kager or annualized is 1,052%. If you look at the 2013 PEs here and you take mm -hmm. out the semiconductors or what you would consider to be cyclical, most of them were trading higher than a market multiple in mm -hmm. 2013. The average SP 500 PE in 2013, I said, was 17 times. Most of these were trading, you know, way above that, if not way above, I mean, over, you know, by a healthy amount, 21 times uh, for AVGO. Uh, what else we got here? FICO, 21 times. Mm -hmm. um, MSCI, 23 times. What yeah. else we got? Netflix. Well, we could take Netflix out. I guess Apple was the only one that was trading at a discount on a multiple basis, uh, on a PE basis to the S&P 500 and Microsoft as well. Microsoft 13 times. Old Dominion. This was an interesting yeah. one that I could see Buffett being interested in. You didn't have this like insane multiple expansion. Now in 2013, the uh, PE was 22 times and today it's at 25 times. Um, but this was, I thought, a good example of a company that just be a predictable business, I guess. Now you look at their gross margins and yeah. they've gone up a good amount. So that also, you know, helps, which has also helped in, uh, you know, operating profit. We've mm -hmm. had gross margins go from about 23% to 36% today over the past 10 years. Yeah. Operating margins go from 15% to 30%. Uh, today, you've had a 10-year CAGR of revenue at 11%. Return on equity has been great, 21%. Uh, percent. But, you know, the market cap in, in 2013 was $4.5 billion, And today, we're at uh, $34 uh, billion. But th I took the total return. So maybe they pay dividends or something along the way, too. How you got that 10-bagger. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. They also buy back stock. Yeah. Um, I mean, the best thing is that you get multiple expansion and margin expansion both, right? So people a lot of times will look at earnings. I mean, I think you should look at gross profit and especially sales too, um, to see how highly you're valuing something. Um, gross profit, if it's possible that you can kind of maintain that in some businesses, but sales generally, um, because at a lot of businesses, their gross profit especially the cyclical ones we're talking about is subject to pricing issues and stuff that other people in the industry could end up capturing a lot of that. So it is sort of the maximum that you can have. Um, I think the, what if for a 10 bagger, especially over some period of shortest 10 years, um, 
you would want to pick something that's going to have its multiple expand and going to have the public, the investing public, reward that expansion with a high, the same multiple PE or higher. The best would be higher. So if you're, um, you know, if you think about it, if your multiple goes up by only 1.5 times and your margin goes up by 1.5 times, you can have a pretty big return in the stock just from that. Um, then you only really need your sales and stuff to go up maybe four times or something over 10 years to be able to get to like a 10 bagger. And that's not actually that hard. Cause like you said, some companies are retaining stuff. So they'd at least acquire other things or whatever. They're not paying dividends. So that's not that difficult. Um, the problem is that with a lot of stocks, obviously, and at different periods in the economy, you would have multiple contraction offsetting this. And so if you look at like, you know, a home builder or something in the last year, not real recently, but a year ago or something, their earnings might be good, but the multiple is already contracting a lot. Um, some banks started contracting ahead of um, problems in the economy and stuff. Um, so you want something like we've talked about where actual results go up, but then also the uh, stock is rewarded with a very high multiple on high earnings. Um, so conversely, you do like if you can have sort of low multiples or something on lower earnings or not a low multiple, but low margins. And some of the ones we talked about, although the multiple doesn't look high on a P, uh, the multiple doesn't look low on a P basis, the margins were poor in that year. Um, but almost all of them had margins exceed the levels that we would have expected which is a concern, like going forward. <laughs> uh, I don't think anyone predicted Old Dominion would have 30% operating margins in 10 years, in 2013. I don't think they would have seen that that would be possible. I don't think they would have seen either gross or operating margins we've talked about with semiconductors happening. A lot of that is post-COVID. Uh, Adobe is uh, another example. $219 billion market cap, trading 46 times earnings uh, today. But if you go back to 2013, it was a $28 billion market cap, and the PE was 97 times. Um, so it's it's contracted over time. Let's see, on the income statement, were they just... Yeah, I, w I don't think Adobe's lost money in the last 20 years or something. Adobe's results are probably most similar to FICO of the companies we've talked about, mm -hmm. um, I would think. Uh, we haven't talked about Intuit or something, but I'd say results are probably similar to that, too. Um, Adobe's yeah. pretty similar business to FICO, yeah. Another good example, though, of the multiple contracting, uh, but they've had a significant amount of growth. Gross profits gone from three point four billion to about sixteen billion today. Operating profit up more than ten times, four hundred forty nine million in twenty thirteen, uh, six point one billion today. Uh, EPS has gone from fifty six cents to over ten dollars today. Um, so yeah. I mean, they bought back stock. So just another interesting example of um, not saying we would ever play this game. I just think it's, it's you know, just look at like, okay, these companies have 10 bagged over the past 10 years in the SP 500. Mm -hmm. Where did that return come from? And what did it look like? So in the case of Adobe, it came a hundred, more than a hundred percent actually from an increase in operating profit. So it doesn't have to do with the number of shares outstanding or the, I mean, some of the return may, but it would have been a 10 bagger regardless even if it didn't have multiple expansion, even if there would never been tax cuts, which there were, even if um, gross profit had actually stayed the same and everything, it's purely through an increase in um, revenue on a fixed asset, a fixed uh, expense base. So it has a fairly fixed expenses, and then it just had an increase in revenue. Um, it, it is worth mentioning that as of 10 years ago, it was contracting in terms of revenue and had cyclical issues. And so this may mostly be a cyclical contraction then a cyclical growth now on a very fixed expense base, which would make it most similar to, like I said, FICO. If you have really, if you can buy something that has very high gross margins, but there's different ways companies calculate gross margins, so it's not always perfect, but very, very high, uh, almost pure profit on variable expenses. Um, uh, very, very, you know, incremental um, revenue, c having almost no variable expenses. So meaning that if you get another dollar of revenue, it basically drops to the bottom line. Um, that's similar to what you see with FICO and with Adobe. 
um, an additional subscriber, you know, it's just all profit for them. And uh, obviously with something like FICO, the growth in terms of things like revenue and gross profit was very low, but the increases in things like operating profit wasn't as low. And uh, it got to about the same place as Adobe in terms of returns in the stock and stuff, largely through an increase in the multiple because it's multiple was lower and now their multiples are similar. Um, actually, FICO is, I think, is a little higher. Um, so, I, you know, I think that anytime you have something that's a very, very fixed expense base, Meta's one, um, and you think that, like, revenue is bad now but going to get better in the future, that would be a good time to buy into it. And both Adobe and FICO, I think, in 2013 were bottoming out in terms of their sectors not having a lot of high spending. Yeah, I just thought it was interesting. You take the cyclical ones or, like, the companies like Tesla out of this and none of them were trading at single digit PEs. And mm -hmm. these are the highest performing stocks in the S&P 500 over the past 10 years. Uh, yeah. You have a lot of cyclical stocks. And the thing that also stood out to me, Jeff, is there is not one bank on this list, which I guess is Correct. the nature of like banking, right? Like if a bank is going to 10 X in 10 years, you'd mm -hmm. be like, Oh, we caught like, what are they doing? Are they, you know, taking a bunch of risk and stuff like that. Um, but I don't know. I just thought it was interesting. Yeah. Um, so there's a few reasons for that. One is has to do with median returns and things like that. If we take a group of the best performers, you're going to generally have very bad performers, which you've excluded. So you're going to have more banks that don't have bad performance than as opposed to semiconductors or something that don't exist anymore. Um, so that's one issue that you have in it. Two is composition, right? Um, three is obviously the start points and end points, which is critically important. In a year, we'll see, in a year or two or whatever, there may be no semiconductors on it. Um, you know, the best, the biggest companies in the world, like Buffett did in 1989, are a lot of Japanese companies. They never again appear on the list. They all disappear, and, you know, there's almost no big Japanese. There's a couple, but not many. Most all the big companies in the world are not Japanese and haven't been since then. Uh, and they weren't on the list until a few years before then. So it's just the peak in the 80s boom that suddenly the list is all dominated by the biggest companies in the world by market value being Japanese and then them all disappearing. Um, so... Those are the issues that um, I would say mainly a measuring of the uh, endpoint, and that people should be very sensitive to that. So whenever we do anything like this, the problem is the list will look completely different if we use a different endpoint. Um, so, you know, I always say use like three year average, you know, rolling average over three years. And measure over all different time periods and stuff. So whether it's talking about oil or something, I would never look at the price in one single year, but say what was the average price of oil in 2021, 2022, and 2023 taken together, average that as one data point, you know, smooth it out over three years and do that for each thing. If you do that, it helps eliminate a lot of these issues, um, which are that it's very, very tied to the measuring point there. Um so like people would have been talking to me and saying, you know, Meta hasn't actually beaten the S&P by much over the last 10 years or something. But they all would have been saying that at the same point when it was down so low. And actually, it's a very short period of time. Um, so, I mean, we talked about Meta when it was in those bad periods. I think we talked about how bad the results have been in ExxonMobil when it had results that weren't very good, but that's because oil was at $30 a barrel or whatever. Um, those quickly are solved by having a different endpoint. Yeah. Let's say you you took Axon in at an end of 2020 and yeah, you'd be like, "Oh wow, it hasn't, you know, made money since or I guess you're at its 2000 levels." Um, but of course, you know, since then the stock has gone up a pretty good amount. Yeah, so that is one thing to keep in mind. Um, sometimes we say like the PE was pretty high, which might make you think people are positive on the stock, but we don't know that because we don't have on the data what was the Kager in the years before. See, often the leader from the 10 year Kager in the 10 years before the period you're measuring is not the leaders in the 10 years after. And so I don't know if, you know, NVIDIA had a great 10 years before those 10 years. Um, we know Microsoft didn't, right? So, like, that's an example. Even whatever the P was, it's also that started from a high level and contracted a lot, which really pushes out all the optimism. 
Um, it's one thing to have a stock at 10 times earnings or whatever at its low, but like Meta is a painful example that way because it all, it was all growth investors. So we could say, oh, 10 times, oh, that's a little harsh, whatever, um, as a value investor in something that we like and that the EPS has been going up. But to a growth investor, that's a number that was never imagined that it could get to 10 times. Um, so they just, it lost all of its everyone got sick of owning the stock and stuff by the end there. So it's not always that they're actually that optimistic about it necessarily. Yeah. And I think using lots of other measures besides earnings would be helpful. It, it doesn't bother me that a company is trading at a hundred times earnings today or something. It does bother me. It's trading at 20 times sales. Um, in a lot of these cases. Now, if it's really early stage company, then maybe not. But, uh, if it's a pretty highly developed company, then yeah, it's, it's a concern. Right, because you got to figure out how high did the sales have to go and all of that to get to that number. Um, but you're right; uh, the PE in general was not low for these things. Yeah, never low. And mm -hmm. I mean, you take the cyclical names out of it, and higher than the average multiple for the S P 500. That's the part mm -hmm. that I thought was a interesting takeaway. Because you could say, "Oh, this is 25 times earnings." The S P 500 at 17. You know, you could discriminate just from a quantitative. Uh, perspective, but the vast majority other than, let's see, what do we have here? Microsoft and Apple started from like a multiple that's less than the SP 500. Right. That is also a size thing. The only reason why they would exist and be in the S and P and all of that. And at that multiple would mean something about their history. In the case of both Microsoft and Apple, they had earlier phases of their company where they were even more dominant than later. Apple would again become very dominant, but, um, that's how they got to that size and everything, right? So they had a fall and then a rise from there. Um, you know, in many ways, Microsoft isn't more important today than it was in 2020 or something. It's in 2000. It's just that the um, part of the business that it's in is so big um, compared to what it was. It's not that it's a bigger player in it. Um, so they had earlier phases that were important for them. Um, some of the, there's some on the other ones that, did too. We talked about broad conferences um, where their industry grew so much. It's not necessarily that the company got so much bigger within its industry, but that's obviously another sort of thing because the S and P is basically big. It had to be big market cap stocks. That's why they're in the S and P. So usually that means they're successful, large companies and stuff. And then also at some point they had to be rewarded with a high multiple. If those factors aren't in place, they probably wouldn't be in the S and P. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here are all the names that, didn't meet the 10 bagger over, uh, you know, 10 years in total return. Um, so I mean, still good companies, uh, on this list, right? Amazon, uh, what else we have? O'Reilly, S P global, all good companies, but they didn't meet that. But I don't know. I just thought a lot of these companies that made this list, they're more cyclical in nature than I would have expected, I guess. So, and then the takeaways from that too, the multiples I trade at were higher than, most of them were higher than the market. Um, there was no banks on there. Yeah. 10 years is really short when you're doing a point to point measurement. Um, mm -hmm. If it had been a 10 bagger at all, uh, 10 years in a row, then yes, absolutely. Uh, that's a very valuable signal. But 10 years is really short, the truth is. Um, and a lot of it is the, the multiple is a factor. We talked about that. Many of these had their multiple expand, not all. Uh, with the exception of Meta, everything we talked about grew its earnings faster than its sales. And Meta did until like a year ago. Um, so picking things that have margin expansion and then riding them for those 10 years or whatever is a very big part of it. I pulled 10 years just because it was easy data to, to compile because <laughs> it was mm -hmm. all, I was on quick at fast. I'm like, oh, we could just look at it over the, you know, the screen easily instead of having to download a bunch of different stuff. Yeah. The other thing then to think about though is, okay, so their margins expanded, right? But then if how much of margin expansion or contraction is industry driven? Because mm -hmm. you've got what, three industries or so are like, half of the 10 baggers that you've got i mean yeah, it's a uh -huh. large number so yeah. in a sense 10 years and a coin flip of whether margins will expand or contract can explain like half of the things that you have um, 
other words, the ability to predict, is it the most important thing is your ability to predict whether margins will be better in an industry over 10 years. Is that a key thing for doing 10 baggers, right? Is looking at industry and saying, do I think margins will be higher or lower? And just focusing on the ones that you think could be a lot higher because it should drive it in lots of the same stocks. That it shouldn't be like we see uh, of the winners in information technology, a lot of them will have their their uh, margins up at the same time. It's not like some will have margins that have gone up and some down and stuff. So margin expansion is a very big part of it. It's not the only part or anything, but if you take out, you know, multiple expansion, margin expansion are really big ones. Margin expansion, some of the things on this list would be off and other things on, though they'd still be good companies and everything, um, if it were it wasn't for that fact. So it's important to pick that. Um and so you look and you say, okay, well, are they have the highest margin they've ever had? Will they have even higher margins in the future? All of that. That's always hard because some things like Old Dominion that we talked about probably had some of the highest it had ever had. Or, you know, like very, it might have been flat, but it wasn't any lower than its record levels. And then it kept going up over time. Whereas some of the other things that we talked about are very volatile you know, the margins in NVIDIA or something are not, don't go straight up over time. They're up and down very cyclically. And it turned out that Old Dominion wasn't as cyclical that way. So you could have easily said, oh, margins are as high as they're going to get. Or return on invested capital is near peak levels or, right, how much better can it really get? And turned out it could get a lot better. So you have said before and written about it, and we've talked about on the podcast, that like 50% of a stock's return would come from the actual company and then the industry itself. So you're kind of talking about that a minute ago, but I'm curious, like, what do you mean by that from like an industry perspective of the return coming from the industry? Uh, so like a hundred years ago, if you invested in all tobacco or all coal, you'd make a lot of more money if you invest in all tobacco. Pretty good, actually. Um, like if you just put all your money in, in tobacco stocks and never sold them, and if they merged with things, kept it and whatever, and never touched it and put it in a drawer, you do really well over the last 90, 100 years or whatever. Um, and coal you would do pretty badly, and it would almost not matter which coal things you picked and which tobacco things you picked, um, just because returns have been so much higher. Um, and that's underlying thing in the business that returns have been so much higher. Information technology is pretty high returns usually. I don't know how high semiconductors are and didn't know that they specifically include in that sector. But, um, you know, some industries just have better returns over long periods of time. Uh, we've talked about lime and cement and stuff from the 30s to the 70s. Returns were probably not that great from the 70s today. They've been getting better to very good. So picking the right industry, you know, um, Railroads have been good for the last 30 years. They were bad for the 100 years before that. Mm. Um, yeah. It's interesting. It's almost like they're forced to get good if they want to survive. The biology well, of it all, right? Yeah. And it... So some... You know, the, this is where we get into the economic theory and all that. Railroads, they, they stopped creating new ones. Right, airlines they stop creating new ones, and so consolidation and, and those things could be a real benefit. Um, railroads had problems with overcapacity, and then other issues that came into. But there, it was uh, they really suffered from having booms that got too big, and then not taken out of the industry. Um, as we talked about with like movie theaters or all of those things, just because COVID happened didn't mean you took out a lot of supply. For a long time, it didn't mean you took out supply in some industries. And so you live a long time with mistakes that you make and having too many cement plants, too much track, whatever. And it takes a long time to consolidate that and grow into it and everything. Um, but different industry concerns, government concerns, uh, environmental concerns and stuff did eventually restrict those and made it helpful. And we talked about that with ESG and oil and all of that same sort of thing, you know if we can restrict asset growth in that industry, then that could be a good industry. Um, so, we, you know, we'll see, but it, it is possible sometimes to know that an industry is getting better for a while. And sometimes it can be pretty late to it and it still works out pretty well. So, like we said, like Buffett and all of those probably, I mean, 
the turn in like airline results was the, those people were probably investing 15 years or something after it started to get better in terms of underlying results. It was disguised a little, like we said, by September 11th and by the downturn in the financial crisis. But if you look at real operating results, absent those cyclical things, the industry probably been getting better for 15 years before the early investors in that got in. And then COVID happened. And so the multiples actually aren't high even now. Um, so sometimes a turn can happen and it can be 20 years later and people are just discovering it, you know, um, and conversely, it can be bad the other way. We talked a little bit about like target Walmart, things like that. I mean, I think it was probably better to be a discounter in the seventies than in the 2020s and seventies through the nineties and stuff, as opposed to the twenties, the two thousands through the 2020s. And yet there can, that's not necessarily reflected in the stocks and everything. Like the results are better early on and then came down and everything. Um, so, you know, it, it, but I mean the underlying is what I'm talking about, the underlying results that they have. A lot of it is determined by the industry, sure. And some of that is product economics, and some of that is the structure of the industry. The product economics is more inherent aspect of the business, and then the um, structure of the industry is the competitive stuff, some of which is just historical and has to do with how aggressive the players are in it and stuff. So that can be harder to predict. Product economics is usually a little easier to figure out. Got it. So we could hop over uh, to Twitter. We did a uh, call for stocks for Snap Judgment. It's been a while since we've done this on the podcast. I said name a profitable, competitively advantaged business trading at a reasonable valuation and explain why you like it because I didn't want people just to spam us with tickers. Uh, so I thought we could actually look at a bunch of them, see what their thought process is and look at it on QuickFS. Uh, the first one on the thread is uh, ticker Ryan, R-Y-A-N. I asked him why he liked it. He said, uh, they're the biggest wholesale brokerage, rolling up smaller shops. Wholesalers take higher commissions for writing more specialized policies. PNC has been trending non-admitted, run by Pat Ryan, who built ticker AON into a powerhouse. It admittedly looks expensive, but they have the vision to establish themselves as a powerhouse in the wholesale insurance segment, which should grow steadily. So we could look mm -hmm. at Ryan. Are you familiar with this company? Ryan yeah, Specialty I don't Group think Holdings. We're see a lot from QuickFS. Um, the company hasn't been public yeah. all that long, and it's only been around for a decade or something. Um, pretty big company, though. Uh, yeah. So we haven't really talked about insurance brokers in on here in the past. I don't think much at all. Uh, it's a very different business than insurance underwriting. Um, it's obviously growing very fast and it's a fairly new company and there's not a lot more that we can say. Like was said in the um, question, you know, the price is not real low in terms of like sales book doesn't really matter for a um, broker, but you know, sales does, and it'll take a little while to grow into that. So, are you familiar with the CEO? Yeah, I, I'm familiar a little bit with this company and stuff, but I don't see that there's much of anything that we can talk to, about in terms of the results. Got it. Uh, very large cap, but ASML due to their monopoly at the bottom of the stack of the semiconductor vertical. Another mm -hmm. semiconductor ASML holdings kind of similar to you talk about like the industry right gross margins have improved here revenue has a 10-year CAGR of of 14 percent um gross profits gone from about 3 billion to 11 billion EV to sales 11.3 times so there's an example right there jeff you said very mm -hmm. rarely would you ever pay more than 10 times sales um looking at it i mean it's it's a, it's a semiconductor cyclical, but you know, it's gotten better and gross margins have done. Okay. Operating margins have improved. Let's see what they've done with their share count over time. Just curious to look at it. Okay. It's gone down 433 million in 2013. It's about 400 million today. Yeah. I don't know. Any thoughts, Jeff, on the company? I mean, the long-term results are closer to, although we're saying semiconductor stuff, it's closer to something like Taiwan semiconductor, which Buffett bought and sold and uh applied materials or something like that it's sort of in between if you just looked on the quantitative stuff it's almost in between those two companies in terms of the 20-year results or something um 
So it isn't quite the same as the other ones that we're talking about. Um, and I think the cyclicality is more muted. Certainly like the individual year increases in revenue or something is definitely more muted. Um, you probably have lower bottoms definitely in terms of how bad it can get, I would say. Um, so that's fascinating, especially considering what the company says it does, that there must be more stability here than you would think, because you would think that actually, um, there could be, um, more cyclicality, especially in bad years and stuff. If you were providing, um, things to an industry which could cut its capex and everything more um and, and that might be where they're talking about the systems so it's so it talks about what the things that they offer as systems and and all of that and so maybe there's more things um that's re that isn't as discretionary that we want to understand um because it doesn't seem like a company that's discretionary capex alone um in fact it, i'd say it doesn't seem like that actually if you kind of match up the years and stuff maybe i don't know possibly not actually with what i just said um there is some pattern here that we could see that probably has to do with the bullishness of the um, semiconductor companies actually that may be why it declined like we saw in 2022 whereas it was peaking in 2020 2021 in terms of growth that's probably what we're seeing. So it may be a combination of a couple of different things, but there is certainly a factor maybe bigger than I thought at first when I looked closer um, that has to do with revenue seems to be leading um, expected results in semiconductor stuff. So when semiconductor companies think they're oversupplied or, or fear they're going to go into an oversupply position within the next year or something, they seem to cut spending it with this company because you can actually match that up a little bit. Um, specifically with the poor revenue years they had, what years those are and stuff, I would say that that's strongly what you're seeing. Um, so, it, but the results, like like I said, like the lows are not as bad even in those years. So, it is definitely closer to, like I said, Taiwan Semiconductor or Applied Materials or something in terms of the long-term results. It is less cyclical than some of the companies we talked about before. So at 33 times EV to free cash flow, it's a 3% yield, right? Free cash flow yield today on the enterprise. Um, so if you're going to hit that hurdle of call it 15 to 16 to 17% over time, you're going to need growth, right? Lots of it. Or, you know, gross margins continue to improve operating margins, but you're going to need growth in, in some fashion. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've done a very good job, at least over the last 10 years, of converting more, you know, earnings growth and free cash flow growth and they have had actual growth in sales and actual growth in assets, which are very good signs. Um, so all of that's excellent. Um, these are very, very high prices to pay for something with the economics that it has. I mean, people pay high prices for Apple, for instance, which has fairly low gross margins um, because it can have fairly high operating margins because of the, the um, amazing scale. Right. And you could have the same thing with this company. Scale is very important. In these things you can see how small is the actual fixed expense aspects of this, you know. Um, but you are paying over 10 times sales or, or whatever, um, or around that for a company that does not have particularly impressive gross margins. But again, that could be due to a lot of scale and stuff. And that's why I mentioned something like Taiwan Semiconductor, in which the Price relative to gross numbers is probably not that great, but operating is better because it probably has scale that's very, very difficult to copy. Um, I mean, if you're behind them by a decade or two or something in terms of just even size, um, not much else. Uh, y yeah. It's not as extreme um, here, but as like Taiwan Semiconductor more probably appealed to Buffett, but there, it, there is somewhat meaningful. It's pretty meaningful, I would say. That's why you can be in a, in a business like this with the gross profits as low as they are. Um, not that the gross profits are bad, but if you take out the really good years with the actual semiconductor companies we're talking about in terms of pricing, 
the results aren't as great. Here you could have pretty good results if you have 45% gross margins or something. You can just see that in the years where they had it. You know, if we take out basically COVID, normally that's what their return years are. So um, I guess concerns would be 20 25% operating margin seems more likely. Free cash flow margins in that range. I think that's more likely the kinds of returns you're going to have. And um, you're paying a really high price for that then, you know. Um, like we said, you're paying, you know, it's it's like you're paying more than, you know, like you have a 3% free cash flow yield or something like that. Um, returns on capital are not amazing at most of these companies. They're very good. Uh, but that means that it, it depends mostly on growth that they'll have in the future. So, um, I don't know. I mean, personally, if you look at the multiples you're paying and, and the economics, would I feel better in like over the counter markets at which you aren't paying higher multiples probably. And you're having at least as much in terms of a lot of the other numbers, whether it's growth numbers or margin numbers. Um, I mean, on a purely quantitative basis, I think they're pretty comparable. Um, yeah, they're very comparable, very, very comparable growth and margins and stuff over the last 10 years here and there. Um, they both might be at kind of cyclical peaks, you know, recently in the last year or so they might've peaked. So yeah, it looks fine that way, but no, it's not something that I would buy. I don't think I would buy anything in semiconductor stuff because if you just look at the numbers the last few years, it's very concerning. It's hard to buy into an industry in which you see, as we see with all these graphs, what's happening with the, um, the, you know, the most recent three years or so, what you're seeing, um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Got it. All righty. Let's see. If I can't invest in the cash tag Jeff ETF, then how about ticker CRL over 50% of its all time high, reasonably valued for a larger company? Would Jeff like a company like this if he had to buy 10 billion market cap or higher companies? CRL is the ticker. Charles River. Charles. Right? Yep. River Laboratories. Life mm -hmm. Sciences. $10.6 billion. Market cap. Uh, let's see. So uh, PE 21 times. EBITDA sales 3.2 times. 10 year median margins on EBIT 14.7%. Uh, Kager in revenue spent 13%. Assets 17%. Free cash flow 6.3%. Yeah. I mean, I can. We know what the company does, but we can also tell you what the economics look like. So what the economics look, and this is a good part of it, actually, this is not a huge company, but um, if we only had the numbers and didn't know what this company did, it looks like a branded food company, actually, which it's not at all. Mm -hmm. um, Charles River Labs provides um, things that you would need to do tests, um, so I think uh, in, in the life sciences stuff. So I think the at the end they discuss some of them, but it, you know it would be things like providing, um, um, like um, literally rats, for example. Yeah. So you have special breeding of certain things. You have things that you would need to be exactly. Um, I mean, I think they have that at the end of the description, some of it, as to how specific it gets in that, you know, where they talk about, um, let's see, they provide testing of biologics, outsourced, um, they provide um, biopharmaceuticals, supporting Fertile the use of research eggs, models. SPF chickens. Yeah. And some of it is a little, the language they're using is a little, here we go, rodent research model strains purpose-bred rats and mice for use by researchers, which I mentioned, I think that yeah. may have been a bigger part of their business early on. But even when they say things like research models and stuff, it's kind of um, jargon and stuff, but that's what we're talking about. Um, companies we've talked about in the past that are kind of close to this in any way, maybe Waters and maybe Transcat, have some similarities in this, you know, we just have not discussed companies that are similar in this at all. But the important thing, what I said with the brand new food thing, cause it, this matters is, um, what I mean is the margins and the returns on capital and stuff are very similar to a brand new food company. You know, 
um, you know, a craft or something without buying something else's, you know, so that it, it bloated up the intangibles um, wouldn't be as, would be much better. But your average, you know, brand that you can name and stuff would be similar to this and having around 35% gross profit, around 15% EBIT or something. Maybe you turn it um, at a fairly low level though. So your, your turns are fairly low so that your return on equity is fairly low. Um, not bad, but in the 15 to 20% range, which is not bad using 35% or so gross profit margins, you know, um, but extreme stability. So they may have had a year with 39% gross margin, may have had a year as bad as 34. This doesn't even affect their operating margin by about as much. I can't be sure because I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I th- would guess that the standard deviation um, in operating margin is similar to gross margin in terms of actual points. Um, like, But when scaled to it, it's larger. But what I mean is that if you look, gross margin contraction and expansion doesn't seem to lead to higher expansion contraction and operating margin, which is unusual in most companies it would. So if, you're, uh, if your gross margin contracts by like 4% or something, you would expect more than a 4% contraction in operating margin. Um, whereas here it looks there, you know, you would think, I mean, there's, it doesn't have to be that way, but that seems likely. And here it's almost one-to-one that we can explain any changes in operating margin in terms of gross margin. Um, it's almost purely the reason why if you look year to year, uh, there isn't a lot of variation in operating margin that isn't explainable by gross margin variation, which is quite fascinating. Uh, because it would just mean that there may be a great deal of stability in terms of expenses and other ways. Um, so, uh, and, and gross margin could be mix and stuff. You know, this company does so many different things. It could easily be mix of what they're selling. Uh, yeah, it looks really interesting. I would say, um, free cash flow is not grown tremendously well and free cash flow conversion though is pretty good. Um, I think I would worry a lot about the capital allocation here and focus on management and capital allocation from what I'm seeing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is, looks like they take out a lot of debt. Yeah. You're, you're probably acquiring a lot of stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we can see. Yeah, you see that right there. Acquisitions. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's what one of the things that I wonder about. But they, I was going to say, do they basically have they may basically been able over the ten years to offset their stock based comp with a little buybacks? Maybe. Um, I don't think they've. I don't think they're diluting too much on a net basis. Um, yeah, not not too much. It's yeah, forty eight million so, in twenty thirteen, fifty one yeah. million today. So considering that you're also acquired, that you're in an industry, they're in like, let's say they're in Boston or somewhere around there. I mean, it says Charles River, so we could guess that. Um, they, uh, you could easily see things. I've seen companies like this in the UK, for instance, that um, give a lot of stock away, right? And so if you're also acquiring things, it means they must be acquiring them for cash and stuff. It's not bad, you know, to increase the share count 3 million or something over 10 years in an industry like this. So they seem pretty disciplined on that point at least. Um, yeah. So earnings have gone up a lot. What I was going to say though, is the issue that's hard with something like this is look at the multiple it's at, for instance, PE and EVD, but and stuff. And then look at something like FICO, which we just talked about being a huge returning thing. So, Double the PE, right? Um, by all earnings measures, double. Obviously, FICO has higher margins, so it has higher sales and stuff. But honestly, is this like is FICO really likely to grow its earnings per share a lot faster over the next ten years than Charles River did it the last ten years? It did the last ten years, but it certainly grew revenue much slower. It was able to grow through expansion in in margin and all of that, right? And then also just the way that margin works to keep in mind that if you've already grown your margin from 20% to 40%, then obviously another 20% increase is now only uh, 1.5 times instead of two times. And so the effect that it has on earnings becomes smaller and smaller. Um, That's always something to keep in mind um, that gets overlooked. 
but it's like inertia that way that the fa- the the bigger and bigger your margin gets the less and less meaningful it can be to continue to squeeze out more margin gains whereas if you're starting from a smaller level the more meaningful it can be anyway it seems like a very predictable company and stuff i'd looked at it for predictability stuff with um 10 years ago or something when i had uh to write stuff based on a screener that took these things uh i thought it is okay not amazing for the reason that you can see here that the um especially when acquiring and stuff the return the the growth is pretty good but the returns on capital are not so high that it's kind of like fico where like any growth is going to be really really impressive this falls more into a category of stocks we don't talk about as much but um where it's less clear how helpful the growth is like if they can do a deal that makes a lot of sense and everything that's great but I think more of this return comes from organic stuff than you might guess um, because the the returns are probably not that high when you factor them in in terms of how fast the company is growing with the returns on capital that they have. See, if returns on capital were much higher, then small amounts of growth would be much more valuable. So I, I guess I would just say, like the example I gave of a brand of food company or something, which don't grow anymore, and this one does, so I would think this should be valued higher than that. Let's put it that way. I would definitely think that you should value Charles River Labs at a higher level than you would value like a you know a major food brand or something. Could, it has nothing to do with those businesses, but if you look line by line, I think you'll be see how similar it is quantitatively with something like that, and yet it grows. And those things haven't grown at the rates that this company is growing in 30 years. So, um, yeah, good, but not great. Um, it's not in the class of the Adobe and FICO and stuff like that, but anyone looking at it knows that. It's closer to the class of like McCormick or something, but it has more growth prospects, I think, than a company like that. So if you were focusing on companies above $10 billion, perhaps you would look at it, think about I mean, it, it, follow it. If I had to own a, a highly diversified portfolio of that size and stuff you know um it would probably be in it probably but if i could own a small number like the number i own now or something you know if i could own a dozen companies over 10 billion or something no i don't think so because of price mainly um like i said i think a good not great so you want a really good price when you're buying a good not great company um but if i had to own 40 companies yeah it, it could be in there already I would think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Got it. Um, let's see. Be fit, lowest cost gym operator in Europe, owner operator, smart and incentives align. Winner take most economics due to scale advantages and clustering that create a thirty plus percent return invested capital on a unit basis per gym and geographical moat reinvestment runway is long. I thought this would be a good one too look at because you uh, spent some time looking at lifetime i don't know how much of a comp that is but yeah lifetime um town sports i looked at other things mm-hmm. too and i've also looked at you know um things that are different because they're not fitness clubs they're not gyms they're um uh weight loss things but you know all the weight watchers and nutrisystem and all those things which have some similarities in terms of uh high customer attrition and stuff uh, so yeah, I have it pull up on the screen. Um, mm-hmm. this is the Euro next Amsterdam be fit EV to sales 3.8 times. You look at the returns negative return of us capital mm-hmm. negative. I don't know how we're going to look at this for the sake of a snap judgment, but any thoughts on the industry? Well, it says it has 1200 clubs. Seeing? So it says operates 1200 clubs, um, in yeah. Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, Germany, France, and Spain. I don't know what parts of Spain it is, and we don't know for sure what parts of France it's in and stuff. But taking the other ones and stuff, those are very high-density, population-density areas um, compared to the United States, extremely high. And um, that's a large number of clubs. It could be fairly small clubs. Um, it has, uses a lot of debt, as you can see there and stuff. But there could be economies of scale that way. Um EV to EBITDA doesn't look terribly cheap, but it looks like the kind of level that these things normally trade at if it's at eight times or something. Um, so it obviously seems like it's grown very fast through acquisition. Um, we're going to think that there's no other way that it could get to that level. Um, but, you know, it didn't go bankrupt in COVID. Yeah. 
it must have been I'd acquiring stuff and things if it if it only dropped twenty seven percent in twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one. Although the, I guess people couldn't all just. I mean, I don't know how that worked. That they were still paying for things. Um, Did you like the the gym industry when you no. profile those companies? No. Mm-mm. Why is that? No. Uh, I mean, I'd rather own a cost. supermarket than a gym. Yeah. So I think the only advantages that gyms have are advantages that also supermarkets and stuff could have. If you lock up really good locations and if you have large, if you have high density and stuff in an area and everything, I think that's pretty good. I mean, Lifetime Fitness had a a very specific sort of model that they were focused on doing and they did it the best that they could. Um, And I think the actual returns for Lifetime Fitness were very high if you kind of adjusted for land ownership and stuff. So the returns looked similar to companies that leased everything and they owned land, uh, not just buildings, but land and access of what they needed and everything. Um, and that may be why the company was taken private or whatever, uh, because I believe it was a real estate focused activist fund that targeted them and stuff. So that may be why. Um, even something like town sports, we talked about that, I believe ended up in bankruptcy. It certainly ended up diluting down to the point of almost being bankrupt. Um, I think it did go into bankruptcy and then emerge though. Um, it, it was also um, preserved for a long time by ownership of some um, thing in Manhattan. So I think that helped them out and got them to the point that they got to there. So um, yeah, it's high attrition industry. Like you just have a lot of customer churn and everything. And so it worries me. I don't know a lot about it either. Just in terms of everyone else would know more about gyms and fitness stuff than I would. That's in the investing business. So. Got it. Uh, let's see. Here's a company that I believe you've written up on the website. Currency Exchange International Corp. It's a name. Hashtag Jeff commented on before just wondering if his views have changed despite the black boxy nature of the business the competitive position is stronger than pre-covid and cheap valuation curious to get your take i don't have much of a take on this company i've read their filings and stuff um Uh i would agree with the black box nature um because it's not really serving customers um that are easy to observe for um an investor so i think when we talk about things like uh western union moneygram you know that you could understand it better um here you're talking about stuff that i think is very difficult to observe so you know as it says in the description it offers financial institutions um international wire payments, foreign check clearing, foreign bank note, and then it goes on and on all these things. But these are things that mainly if it was offered at more um, retail stuff, then it would be easier to understand for the investor. But I think it is harder to understand because of uh, what companies use it in and what amounts and stuff. So if you're in the industry and you know people who do or you could get scuttlebutt on it, then it would be different. But absent that, I think it's hard. My guess is people trade this thing just on the basis of like looking quantitatively at it. I've never read a good write-up on it or anything. I've read write-ups on it, but never anything that I felt explained it better than reading about the company. So the black box nature thing is something that is a concern because I don't know how well people understand the competitive dynamics and stuff of what they're doing. But there's other companies like that. I mean, we talked about Points International, right? I would compare this most to that company. Um, If people don't know, Points International does airline mile stuff. But since it's hidden in terms of um, being like white label or whatever kind of stuff, you know, you think you're transacting with Southwest Airlines or something, but actually it involves a transaction in which you're dealing with a program that's run by Points International. Um. So people can understand the airlines, they can understand credit card companies and stuff, but they don't necessarily understand a company that deals just in airline miles. I think this is similar to that. Um, what are your thoughts on currency exchange? I don't really have a lot. I've seen it written up before as well. I felt like it was kind of complicated in the sense of like exactly what they're doing. You are right. The There's a lot of volume, if I remember correctly, that comes through yeah. this company, like to get mm-hmm. that $66 million. Huge. 
in revenue yeah. it's like multiples right so it's kind of like yeah, what yeah. is that how does that translate it was just i remember being like oh just kind of complicated but i have seen write-ups on it i do believe that um insiders own i think a good chunk or i think maybe this is his second company i mm-hmm. think he was successful his first company beta less than one share turnover seven percent it would fall under yeah. that illiquid stock yep. but i just remember being like yeah there's a lot of volume that goes to this company and not exactly knowing what that is that's the black boxy nature of it right and so like from 2014 to 2019 revenue more than doubled and yet there was no increase in operating profit but there was an increase in gross profit but that's why i would compare it to something like points international where it's a little complicated in understanding there must be different drivers of what is highly profitable rev- volume for them and what is less profitable volume for them in terms of mix and what they get from it. But like you said, it's a much bigger business than people might realize because you're operating on small amounts of commission type stuff on large amounts of um, volume when you're doing these kinds of things. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you're huge in terms of your relationship with your customer because your customers are often very big in terms of the volume that they're doing. So. A lot of scuttlebutt or something would be helpful with this company, probably. Maybe talking to management, something like that. But yeah, very aware of the company, yeah. United Natural Foods, largest and low margin grocery slash other distributor temporarily suffering on income because of inventory slash contracts, but it's able to translate 100% of inflation. Okay, let's see what Mm -hmm. that is. United Natural Foods, Inc., Okay, yeah. there you go. Uh, $1.2 billion market cap, $3.2 billion EV, together with its subsidiaries, distributes natural, organic, specialty produce, and conventional grocery and non-food products in the United States and Canada. It operates in two segments, wholesale and retail. Uh, EV to sales, 0.1. 10-year median margins on EBIT, 2.5. 10-year CAGR and revenue, about 19%. Uh, gross margins, eh, about lower, uh, but operating margins mm-hmm. looks like the past five years, four to five years, about 1%. That's kind of low. I mean, I know this is a low margin business, but how are inventory turns here? Turn capital is, is not uh, good. No. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We've seen better, better ones in this industry. Yeah. So the, it's a bad business. I mean, we just have to be honest about that. I mentioned supermarkets and stuff. I think this is a worse business than that. But there are other distributors that look similar to this. Without using large amounts of debt, I don't think that you create economic value in this industry. Um, they've grown very fast, and that's part of the reason why their free cash flow conversion is so poor. But even if we kind of give them that, which I'm not sure we should because I have skepticism about how well you can convert um, – reported earnings into actual profit in this industry Um, without using debt. It just doesn't create value, right? We can see a return on invested capital has peaked at about 10% in the past. Um, And like I said, I don't think they've converted that into growth any uh, with growth. I don't think they've converted that into free cash flow that well. You could say, well, if they didn't grow at all, then it would all convert to free cash flow. Maybe, maybe, Um, but you know, they've only doubled operating profit for instance, over the last 10 years. And yet they've had trouble creating any free cash flow on that basis. So when we talk about product economics, the product economics here are terrible. Um, the median result is like a 6% return on invested capital. Um, like I said, the best is 10%, which is very bad. But the good news is their price to book is less than one, which is what we need here because we wouldn't look at this company unless it was less than one. But if it gets cheap enough in terms of current assets and things like that, then you'd look at it and you say, okay, should I consider this, Right. Now, it has some problems. It has a negative net current asset value basis, right? So its total current assets are only $3.8 billion. I'm I'm not using the most recent quarterly one. I should probably do that. Um, yeah, Three, $3.7 billion, um, in January, and uh, total liabilities, though, are five point seven. So because you're basically that's long-term debt that's in there. So you don't have a net net here, you know, um, it's not just that it's not net net, but it actually has negative, um, working capital, which is a bit of a concern. Um, but it doesn't have huge amounts of intangibles and goodwill. I guess it's about 800 million on a balance sheet. That's about seven and a half billion, um, equity, you know, it still leaves about a billion intangible equity. Um, 
assuming a billion intangible equity company goes for 1.2 billion, I wouldn't pay more than tangible for it. Certainly. I think I'd like it at two thirds of tangible. So if the stock dropped about 50% or something, I would really like it at today's price. If the margins improve and stuff, people could like this business. I could see it going up. It's something you could write up for value investors club. And I think it might work and you know, that kind of thing. But, um, in the long run, I don't like it. So I was going to say, you would be interested if it fell 50%, even with considering it a bad business that has bad unit economics. Yeah. You would still be interested mm-hmm. in it purely on price. Yeah. I think two thirds of tangible book value. It's very predictable. And I mean, usually I, I, you know, to have not done Scuttlebutt in this company or anything, but usually these are very, your customer has very predictable sales over time. It got thrown off by COVID and stuff, but usually very predictable sales. And then they have pretty predictable relationships with you as well. So, um, yeah, the company should probably use debt and stuff and it uses some, um, it's not impossible. I mean, at two thirds of tangible book or something, it would probably get an offer from private equity or something at closer to tangible book. Um, I don't know if you get an offer at like what it's at now. I think that's pushing it. I mean, what's our EV to EBITDA and stuff here? 5.7 times. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, the problem is on a lot of these, I think you could buy a supermarket stock for similar valuations. Yeah, you could. So I kind of like their customers better than them to some extent, but the price is not crazy. And if they get any sort of hiccup, you know, because of how low the margin is and everything, any sort of thing that improves the margin, it'll work out. So you could definitely see this thing going up just because of that. People get excited by that. You know, I, my problem is not in the short run. It's just in the long run. Um, is that I don't think this is a business you want to be in for the very long run. I don't think it's something you want to hold, but, uh, it is something that if you buy something on such low margins, um, you can often get a better result. So, I mean, margins are half of what they were before, you know, to a third almost of what they were at their peak. Um, yeah, if you buy a company at six times earnings where margins are lower, it's probably not going to three times earnings. So if margins do expand and stuff, the stock will probably pop. So Mm -hmm. I could see it in some quantitative value portfolio as part of it. You know, why do you think operating profit has gone down so much? The operating margins? Well, that's a very good question. Usually these things, these things get better with scale, right? There's been no decrease in gross margin. Um, it's purely a decrease in operating margin. It could be due to cost increases. Um, because if you do the math, I'm not sure how much real volume has increased since COVID. Actually, since COVID, it hasn't increased at all. It's down a little bit, probably. It's up 26%, 20, I mean, with compounding and stuff, high 20% over three years of COVID plus a little bit of now. At a very large gain in 2019, so depending on when their fiscal year ends, it probably ended a period that's close to the start of COVID or something. Maybe it doesn't line up perfectly with December. Um, yeah, after that big boom in revenue in 2019, it seems like it's been weak. Uh, my guess is weak real growth since then. It can't have gained market share and stuff, but its customers may have lost market share. Probably did during COVID. That would be my guess. It bought something too. I mean, that's that huge growth in uh, right revenue. Before, yeah. Right before COVID. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I mean, it's a lot of debt compared to, I mean, that's why I was warning about net nets and things like that. I I don't know if I want to pay for, it could totally work out. I'm not saying that it won't. If your idea is to be in it for one to three years, this may work out. I think though, as I showed with the, it's not a net net. It has negative working capital stuff that way, tight margins and whatever. It's not something I want to be in for the long term, And it's something that I think has some credit risk as compared to directly owning, uh, uh, some of their customers more like a supermarket. Um, but it, it's short-term speculation. It's, it's fine. And if you bought 30 of these and hold them all for one to three years, it'll work out, you know, like something will happen and their margins will double at some point, your stock will go up and you can sell it for a one-time gain. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, dollar general is interesting at these levels, normalized 16 times PE or 15 times EBITDA EBIT. Business has very strong execution for a retailer, has five to seven years left before reaching store saturation, stores mostly local and rural centers that mm -hmm. aren't as attractive to other retailers. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's correct. True. Yep. My local uh, closest place to shop is a dollar general. And I knew someone who ran dollar generals as one of their jobs. So there's a Dollar General right by me. There's a Dollar General that's also next to a family dollar across from it. It's not next to it, which is, of course, with auto parts retailer, right? We talked about that, like, um, you know, in your 10 baggers and stuff. Um, you know, there's always a Dollar General is like always next to your O'Reilly or your AutoZone or mm -hmm. Advance or whatever. Always. And yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, mine by me and stuff is maybe a little rougher than Dollar General normally gets. Um, usually it's more rural than ha being in a more urban thing. I mean, in a kind of urban, a rural city kind of thing. So I think they have some problems with that. But normally they're just more rural. Um, a lot of logistics to it. Um, they have to deliver all this stuff to the pretty small stores. So you see a lot of... Um, that's the kind of part of the business that's most impressive to me, I would say. So uh, based on this, 15 times earnings, 10 times EBITDA, EBITDA return on equity, 10-year uh, median returns, 26%. Uh, revenue, CAGR, 9%. Assets, 11%. Free cash flow, negative, 2.7%. Uh, return on equity, median returns, phenomenal, uh, 26%, as I said. But it looks like it's actually gotten better in the past few years. Gross margins, great. Uh, operating margins, stable. You're familiar with the company. You've read the book on Dollar General. Yeah. What are your Should thoughts on the that? company? Yeah, My Father's and, Business. Yep, My Father's Business, which is an excellent book. Yeah. It's, yeah, um, written by the son, correct? Because it goes through the whole um, period where they're public and everything. Um, but yeah. covers the whole he's period. He's not CEO of, anymore, I don't think. Right. But it covers the whole um, period before then um, when it got started up and everything, which is interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like Walmart, right? I mean, that's like the history that it has. It's better business today and everything than Walmart, right? So I, at the same prices, I'd like it better than Walmart, I think. I understand the business better than Walmart, probably. Um, you know, like I said, though, I, I don't know. I mean, if you're listening to this in big cities and things, you probably should go someplace and see a Dollar General because I think uh, it's like tractor supply. I don't think it's something that you would understand. Um yeah. What do you think about his comment on saturation? Uh, he says, uh, has five to seven years left before reaching store saturation. Hmm. I don't know. I just spent a while in rural Oklahoma and it was pretty saturated. But, um, uh, but also it's more from that part of the country and everything. So, I mean, it's not from that part of the country, but it's been in that part of the country for a long time. Um, was it rural Tennessee it started in? Do you remember what state yeah. it mm -hmm. actually started in? Yeah. Tennessee. Are they in Nashville now? Because I remember part of the book. Yeah. They, they were moved talking it. about yeah. where to go. Yeah. I believe they did. Yeah. Um, so um, th there's a lot of places where they're the only real place to shop in those places that I was in where, where mm -hmm. Walmart isn't. So that's the advantage. Um, like I was saying, where, where I live, there's a couple of Walmarts, so it's not great dollar general country. I don't think that it's great for dollar general to be in places where there's also Walmart, but in those places that I was talking about where it's really rural and you won't have a Walmart or certainly not a superstore, um, I think that that's good. Um, that they're, that, you know, that they may not be saturated in those places. That's true. Um, mm -hmm. although that might be larger store format and different things that they carry it in and stuff more than anything else, I would guess. Um, I think temporarily the results may be lousy, but we'll see. Their customer base benefited hugely from COVID. Mm -hmm. So it really they were puts kinda a lot of... way back on, to 2020 levels. Yeah, I'm not surprised by that because you could really see a boom in um, who their customers are and who benefited the most from COVID in terms of um, excess savings and all of that. So, mm -hmm. and you know, and then there's lots of pressure with um, wages and 
systems and things like that. Um, so that's always a thing to keep down expenses. They're very big on keeping down expenses. There's very few places I've seen that operate looking as badly as a dollar general is willing to look. So, um, yeah, I mean the one by me just, I don't think it wants to accept payment stuff and it just says that it's broken all the time and stuff, you know, to do that. I think that's, uh, possibly a security thing. Cause I've noticed that they don't have enough people on it for that. Like I said, it's better in places where there isn't crime issues. And then, like I said, I knew someone who ran dollar general and ran their own store too and stuff. I was going to say, and, what's the scuttlebutt on that? The yeah. That ran it. So they're very efficient. I mean, they, the reason they don't, they work for other companies like Walmart and stuff is because it was cushier job than dollar general. You get more support. Um, Dollar General is more focused on keeping expenses low and uh, and which is o- overworking for the manager and stuff as compared to uh, Walmart, which is a lot easier. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I know a couple people ran Dollar General actually and ran departments in Walmart or ran entire Walmarts. Um, and, uh, you know, Walmart isn't the company that it was with Sam Walton and stuff. And I think maybe it would be closer to what Dollar General is. Um like I said, the Dollar General thing, I think, yeah, with the saturation and all that, I think in really rural areas is not necessarily a huge problem. I do think in places where there's some crime and stuff, it, it is difficult to, uh, you it, you need more employees if you have issues with that. I think it's very hard for someone to manage that if they're also having to manage um, crime issues at the same time, including from the public and stuff. I don't mean employee shrink and stuff. Um, so, I yeah. But I mean, most of the places we're talking about with saturation, that's kind of the issue. And it's not in places where that's more of a problem. Uh, you know, it, it often trades at not that different a price than Walmart or something. And I'd like it better than Walmart. But like I said, uh, long term, I would like it better. But short term, I maybe would be a little more worried. You know, if you're worried about the things with the recession and stuff compared to what COVID was, Dollar General's customers are the people who are most effe- most boomed during COVID and will most contract now, Right. Like they're the marginal. If we're going from three and a half percent unemployment to six and a half or something, that three percent are all Dollar General customers. Everyone who had stimulus and stuff from that, and you know, is Dollar General stuff in terms of how much it affects the balances of their accounts. Um, it really affected areas where Dollar General is. Well, if you're worried about it, you would be worried short term, but more positive long term. That's probably a good situation mm-hmm. to maybe get a you know an opportunity. Look at 08 there. I mean, yeah. in 07, you could see from 07 to 08 to 09, what happened in the last major recession. Yeah, they were growing 7 to 9% a year in the years before COVID. So I would go back to more to that. Um, I also think they would like, you know, oh, who knows? Some of the, I was going to say that lower inflation would, would be helpful too, but that might not be true. We could look at next company, which... Uh, he had said his uh, net net market wise. Let's see. We could go to the balance sheet. It's a eighty five million dollar market cap. Enterprise value negative seventy six million. Uh, we could mm-hmm. pull up the quarterly balance sheet. So we could look at. Uh, let's see. Total current assets two hundred eighty one million. Total liabilities uh, six hundred ninety six million. However, yeah. three hundred fifty five million of that is deferred revenue. All their liabilities are basically deferred revenue. I would not call yeah. it a net net though, because deferred, liability, deferred revenue is a real liability. Yeah. But they have about, um, let's see, they have about mm, 630 million, a little bit more than that or something in uh, deferred revenue overall, which is huge for a company this size. That's why their retained earnings is negative because they haven't earned that portion yet. Um, so, most of it is that, I mean, when we look at the market cap and everything, it's gigantic versus it. So there really isn't much in the way of liabilities and stuff except for deferred um, revenue. So you would not count that as a net net? You can't liquidate it or anything, no. Um, but yeah, I mean, if it plays out over time, then you'd say, okay, well, you just have to provide the service. And if the service isn't very expensive to us to provide, then it's not a problem. Um, what is sales? Sales five hundred twelve million. Okay, so that is a little interesting that they're more they have more than a year of um, deferred revenue on their books. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is probably too close to comfort for us. It's too close to what we do and stuff. 
I don't think I would invest in, you know, that industry. I think we talked about that before. So, I mean, they say they have 17 million digital platform members. I think they said 14 million. Yeah, they're paid digital platforms. Members are only 840,000. You know how much they say that they make per um, average customer? How much? $520 a year. Wow. Yeah. I think that's because they cross. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the SGNA, so their editorial team is quite large. Um, yeah. Yeah. Look, I wrote an investing newsletter, so that's basically what this company does, right? It cross sells a bunch of investing newsletters and that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I mean, it says that the, I don't know what that means, the recurring revenue rate, but it's, it's incredibly high. That can't be right. Really? Um, I mean, it could be right. But so it says it's 86% having, I don't believe that that has anything to do with churn and stuff though. So, I mean, I think they mean people are signed up for it and stuff, but it has to churn at much higher rates than that. Um, most of the best ones that I know that are individual ones are down at like 50% in terms of churn, uh, you know, that they lose about 50% of their customers a year, to be honest. So, uh, anyway, not a net net, but yeah, it could be a good business and it could be something to buy. Uh, last one we could go over how to join uh, a frequent stock on the podcast. Jeff has mm -hmm. written about this several years ago. He had concerns about the expansion into France It is optically inexpensive and they seem to have a solid capital allocation policy. Return of asset capital has come down somewhat, but is still solid. Mm -hmm. So we could pull it up on QuickFS, How to Joinery Group. Uh, currently trading at 10 times earnings. EV to free cash flow, 13 and a half times. EV to sales, one and a half times. Return on equity numbers, 10-year uh, median returns, 41.8%. Uh, has been coming down over the past 10 years. 10-year uh, uh, gross margins, very high and, and stable. And there was a boom through COVID. You see that. Yep. In 2021, and now it's uh, kind of come back down. What are your thoughts on Howden Joinery? They only had one year before COVID where they made much more than 30 pence. Like I'd say a three or four year average ahead of COVID was around that number, around 30 pence. Um, so we're talking over 20 times that level. But you got to say, okay, there's been a lot of inflation and it's not going back down. So uh, you got to get used to it. You got to get used to these higher numbers. Um, as you can see from 2016 to 2019, like I said, probably 30 pence was their average earnings and they were in the five to 7% growth a year. That was with opening new things. And then it boomed by a huge amount since then. And that's caused operating profit to basically double, um, you know, gross profit up one and a half times sales up one and a half times. Um, so that's the difficult thing is there a big housing boom in, the UK in terms of remodels and stuff, especially in, and, um, this company is basic, mostly UK. And it's also in Ireland, France. Um, and it, um, is easiest to think of as like a serving contractors, right? Like a home Depot that serves contractors or something. It's not exactly what it is, but that, that kind of thing would make more sense to people. It's not available for the general public. They don't price so that you can see what the prices are and everything. And yeah, as it's where it says joinery and all that, you would think cabinets and everything, but they have more and more of their own stuff that they make at their own factory and, and, and sell. Um, so a lot of the things that you would need to buy for the kitchen, uh, if you're a contractor or renovating things, uh, I'm mostly concerned about, yeah. How, is there a high amount of, um, activity since COVID? Yeah. Because are you paying more like 20 times than 10? I wouldn't be surprised if you're paying closer to 13 to 17 times earnings than 10 times earnings. I don't know exactly what it is, but is it 15 times? What is normalized earnings? I don't think it's probably right where it is right now. But so far with where they've guided and everything, I think it's pretty good. I don't know if they've had a thing later than the last thing I saw, but they do provide trading updates during the year. And the last one I remember, which I think was two months ago or something, um, 
basically has them in line with what they expected and stuff and not coming down the way that I said would be my concern. So, yeah, of all the stocks we've talked about, this one's definitely the one that would interest me the most. I'd be most willing to buy and stuff. Um, doesn't fit the category of what we talked about with like the, it's it's smaller than like a $10 billion market cap company. You know, in, in US dollars, it might be only $5 billion or something. Mm-hmm. Do you have any thoughts on their capital allocation? Yeah, I like it. The, the, that's a big reason for being more interested in buying it and everything is that it's really it seems like it's serious about possibly buying back meaningful amounts of stock. Now, they intend to keep a certain amount on hand, so I don't know that they're going to, when you kind of do the calculation of what that would mean, um, I don't know they're going to buy back stock uh, more this year or something, you know, lower level and the, bring their cash down to a lower level than it's at now. But on average in the future, I expect them to buy back stock. So if the stock stays this low, they'd be able to buy back a bunch. They've bought back, let's see, 5% of the company in the last three years or something, but uh, mainly in the last year. And they had their share count had been rising up until mm, 2014 or something. Then it flattened out a bit and started to come down. I would say there's more, it's clear they're going to buy back stock. I think I wouldn't be surprised if they, on average, I would be more comfortable with the idea they're going to buy back stock over the next 10 years than they did over the last 10 years or eight or whatever they st- when they started buying back stock, which would be helpful for a company like this. Yeah. Like we talked about CarMart or something. It should be similar with this in terms of what those buybacks drive. They've communicated that too more in the investor presentations and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see. What do we, um, they're, yeah, now they've also increased their dividend a lot over time since before COVID because I think they've they paid out a dividend. Their peak dividend was at 20 pence. And like I said, that would have been two-thirds or something of what their pre-COVID earnings were. Mm-hmm. So it's not a low payout ratio either. So you like the stock. To me, it sounds like, um, you know, it's thinking through, well, have they over-earned? What's it going to look like in the future? You like the capital allocation. Uh, it's just really a pricing, right? Like, are you paying 10 times earnings? Or are you paying 20 times earnings? Yeah. And you know, with the what price of other stocks today and stuff, is it really that big a deal if you are paying closer to 20 times? I don't think there's a hundred percent chance you're paying 20 times. Um, I don't expect to go right back to where it was pre COVID in nominal terms. Um, maybe in real terms or something you could, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Like way more than any other stock that we've discussed today. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. <laughs> mm-hmm. Way more. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And probably should buy it or something, you know. I mean, you can't just sit there forever waiting on, um, is it going to go back to the, the, is waiting for an economy and everything to get back to more normal levels of activity. But I do think that the amount of remodeling and everything in the UK is just like in the US, ha- went to higher levels than normal. I don't. Th- I think people will travel more and stuff and spend less redoing their kitchens than they did in the early part of COVID. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I don't know that inflation is going to come down quite to the levels we might expect. So I, it, I think that there's a certain level that there's a bump from it that is likely to be permanent, you know? And that's part of it, whether we're talking about... Um, BTS, when we're talking about an oil company or we're talking about um, Dollar General or Howden Joinery or whatever, um, there certain activity stuff can get back to a normal level or whatever, but we're not going to get back what was inflated away in terms of nominal stuff. So that will distort the numbers for the past. I mean, so even if we got back down to normal levels of activity, would that be 40 pence a share in earnings now instead of 30 Certainly there's been at least that much general inflation probably that isn't going to go away. So he pointed out that their return of asset capital has declined. Why do you think that is? And do you have any thoughts towards that? I mean, if you look at 2013, 52%, it looks like it peaked in 2014 at about 57%. And where we sit today, you know, we're hovering around, you know, 23, 24, 25%. Uh, I mean, return on, so return on invested capital technically has 
but there hasn't been much of a change in return on equity, which would matter more. I mean, that's what ultimately matters. Nor do I even think there's been a change that's that meaningful in return on assets. Um, yeah. I mean, honestly, the, for most companies, if you just use return on assets, which is easier to calculate than trying to take some websites return on invested capital, it would probably work as well or better. Certainly for a bank, I would just use the return on assets and stuff. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, there is some legitimate concern about that. I don't think in terms of the reported results, there's a concern about that. I don't see anything in the results that would concern me. Um, but there is in terms of longer term, will the returns in other places in new depots not be as good? Um, are they clustered enough? Um, are, you know, do they have the scale that they need in places like we're talking about with Ireland and France? Um, so, yeah, that's been a concern for me outside the UK, whether they will, uh, and I guess they've also explored stuff with Belgium and some other places, um, whether they will ever have as good a model in other countries. And even if France was a huge success, ultimately, you know, it would have to be as big a success, which is a very high level of saturation for all of France to be worth as much as the UK part of it. I mean the home home owner market in France is not really bigger than the UK. And, um, that, you know, they're kind of possibly pretty saturated, but if the stock is cheap enough and you buy back your stock, then it's not a problem because the, the buybacks, which you talked about are based on saying, okay, there's a certain level of cash that we want. And then after that, we should either pay dividends or buy back the stock. It's not like here's a certain level of buybacks we should do. And so if that's the case, they could potentially buy back a lot of stock if they do that. Then they would become more like Games Workshop where they say, okay, excess cash we use. Um, so the stock being cheap for a few years could be really good. So it's a setup more like when we talked about FICO or something. It's set up much more like that where if it sits at a low price for a little while, FICO might have taken three years from the bottom to double its multiple or something. If the same thing happens here with Howden Joinery and they can buy back stock between 10 and 20 times PE, you know, that's pretty good. They'll buy back a lot of the company in that amount of time. Now, it's different that they pay a meaningful dividend and stuff, and I wish that they didn't pay that and that they were focused 100% on buybacks. I'd be more interested in the stock if they paid no dividend and said they were going to buy back, use every dollar or every uh, pound over, say, 300 or whatever um, million that they decided it was the amount they wanted to hold would be used for buybacks, then I would be much more excited for the stock if there wasn't the dividend aspect of it because the dividend's pretty meaningful. Um, like the dividend part of it, if you think about, would be... Um, they could compound their... You know, like their share count could drop by more than 3% a year or so if they just didn't pay a dividend at all and focus that on the buyback part of it. You know, it would go up by more than that. So you'd have nice earnings per share growth just if they um, could devote all of it to buybacks. So, but dividends fine too. I mean, but I would be more interested in the stock, a little more likely to buy it if it was focused 100% on the buyback. It's not the level of the dividend that matters as much as how much they raised it since COVID and that they did that and everything. It shows a willingness on their part to increase the dividend, and that's pretty common in the UK to target progressive dividend policies, as they say. So I just would worry that maybe not as much will be focused on the buyback as I would like, which minimizes the downside, the the upside a little bit. You know, it, it lowers the potential for a really big positive outcome. Got it. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us on the Focus Compounding Podcast. Thank you to everybody that sent in stocks uh, for us to look at, uh, to be on the lookout for um, the next time we do a call for stocks or a tweet for stocks. You can follow me on Twitter at, at Focused Compound. Uh, be sure to hit that subscribe button wherever you are listening or watching us. And uh, we appreciate all the support. Rating and review still goes a very long way for us. All the information is down in the description. If you're interested in learning about our money management services, you can reach out to me at andrewfocuscompound.com. And if you like this uh, website, QuickFS, if you want to sign up, make sure you tell them that you heard about them from Focus Compounding that helps support everything that we do here on the podcast. I want to thank everybody so much for all the support and 
We will see you next week in the next podcast. Take care.